This is Katrin with Disability Rights New York. Welcome to our podcast, Empire State of Rights Closed Captioned. We are here to bring you information on the most relevant topics regarding disability rights and advocacy. Today, we welcome John Scott Richardson, the Theater Program Director at Amarinda American Indian Artists, Inc. He's here to discuss the mission of the organization, the services it provides, and the importance of cultural equity and representation. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having us. So, John, before we get into the organization, can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and why you decided to uh, get interested in this program specifically? Okay, uh, sure. Um, I like to also first do uh, our formal uh, introduction or uh, of myself. Uh, my name is uh, John Scott Richardson. I'm an enrolled member of the Halawasa Pony Tribe. My maternal lineage is Nezama Saponi, and my paternal lineage is Maharan Tuscarora. I come from a small community in North Carolina, and my Native American name is Janokse, which means move like a fox. And so, um, so yeah, I'd like to just, oh, that's our former formal introduction of ourselves when we are in, in public in different venues. Um, and so I'd also like to bring acknowledgement of uh, we are here on the island of Manhattan, which is the unceded lands of the Lenape people, as well as the Delaware, Muncie, and other nations that are, have come here and moved various places. And so I bring this, uh, my greetings from that perspective to you. Um, to you answer so much your question. For <laughs> Yeah, to answer your question, though, how I got involved, um, you know, it the organization reached out to us as well um, to see, you know, how, first of all, to bring some light to our organization, because we are part of uh, an underserved population um, in the New York City area, pretty much, you know, be honest, across, across the country, uh, the Native American population and groups. And so, um, you know, there was also an interest to see how we utilize or if we have these, uh, you know, challenges in our community, as well as how are we being more adaptive to and be more inclusive to, you know, everyone that we work with, right? And because we typically have a community-based approach to how we do things. And so, um, you know, that is, um, you know, so everyone's included, right? We never really, I'll, I'll get a, a, a little bit into that a little bit more later, but we never really separate people based on groups. We just really kind of, you know, work with whoever we have available because we always, <laughs> we always are challenged with resources, right? And so if we come with someone that may have a, a physical challenge in some capacity, you know, whatever they want to offer us, we always embracing. And so that's, um, you know, how this kind of conversation started. And so we're talking about Emerinda, and I, I love that you're bringing up uh, really not only inclusion, but intersectionality, right? We're talking about the whole person. We're talking about as someone is coming in to be a part of your community-based organization, you are starting from the person first and then deciding how are you and your gifts going to be able to work with us in our organization? Does, does that sound like that's the way it's going? Yeah, yeah, because, you know, again, we, we, you know, I mean, there's, because we come from a community mindset, right, it's always whatever someone can offer, right, whatever it is, and so, and, and we never really, like, I have, just to give you an example, I have a nephew that is, um, you know, uh, has some issues with uh, cerebral palsy, right, and so, but we never kept him from doing whatever he wanted to do, right? He wanted to dance, he wanted to drum. We, you know, we give him a drumstick or we teach him to dances and let him do his thing. And we never think about, oh, well, how can we adapt this to fit him? He's figuring it out on his own, right? Because he knows where his, his challenges are better than we do, right? So he's taking what we have and saying, okay, I'm going to adapt this to me and make it work for me, right? And that's kind of, our approach and that's how we've always kind of worked from our community perspective you know um and so uh yeah that's <laughs> right and supporting 
the the individual in finding yes. that out for themselves and being supportive of whatever it is that they need in order to participate, which is really great. And, and so let's talk a little bit more about Amarinda um, itself and what its mission is at its core. At its core, Amarinda um, is a organization that's 35 years old. It's been uh, here in New York City. Um, it started out of um, the original um, American Indian theater movement that started here in New York, right? And with Hane Gigama. And so therefore it um, basically looks at the preservation uh, and curation, as well as development of new Native American artists, right? So um, it looks to preserve the American Indian art movement that started here in New York City. Right. And they've written a publication about it called No Reservations. It's a, it's a book that uh, looks at the history of that movement in New York I and mean, how it spread across the country and other artists that it has influenced. But it also looks and gives a platform for emerging artists. Right. And to bring their vision to a larger audience. Right. Because a lot of times there is not many Native American art curated shows here in New York. Right. Maybe in Santa Fe, New Mexico or places like that, where there's a lot larger American Indian influence, you know, statewide. But here in New York City, um, which is the greatest, probably the greatest city in the in, you know, United States, maybe even the whole world. Right. And so everyone wants to come here to be seen and be shown. And so Amer Amarinda has been the on the forefront of preserving that history as well as uh, giving an opportunity for emerging artists to bring their craft and skill to a larger, broader audience. Um, we, we look at four disciplines within our, under our umbrella, which is film. The other one is theater performance. The other one is um, visual arts. And the last one would be literary. And so you and I uh, have had the pleasure of chatting beforehand. And one of the things that we talked about was representation, right? And so as we look at uh, movies, television shows, literature, theater, um, and having representation that is culturally competent is something that hasn't necessarily been mainstream, right? We've seen a lot of different, um, whether it's films or television shows that maybe representation was not exactly accurate. And so will you talk a little bit about what it means for representation in all areas of art to be not just culturally sensitive, but competent, understanding what the representation uh, means to the greater community um, as, as Younger people are, as you said, emerging artists and children and looking towards their future. Talk to us a little bit about that. OK, I'll try to be not so long. <laughs> I, can, I can get a little long winded sometimes. Um, but um, there are sort of two sides to that, 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 that um, conversation. One is that historically, we were never allowed to tell the story from our perspective or our narrative. Right. Historically. So, you know, everything written about us, all the photographs about us, all the movies that prior to the last couple of years have always been produced and directed by generally non-native, you know, um, individuals and no offense to them. They're doing, you know, bringing a story to life or doing the best that they do for the vision of what they're trying to do. And but we were never allowed to tell the story from our perspective. So now there's over the years, there's been an emergence here and there. And I would say of late, uh, the last few years, has been a strong emergence of young Native voices telling the story from their narrative, right, from their perspective. Um, and it's not so much to just, it's not, of course, not to discredit anybody else's narrative, it's, it technically, but it also, it, what it does, though, it gives a fuller scope of the story that we're trying to tell, right? And, 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 and representation. So that's why we feel representation matters. And I think about the quote that um, recently I, I was watching a podcast of, uh, not a podcast, but just a little interview with Denzel Washington, 
and the cast from Fences, right? And so the lady asked Denzel, said, well, how come you didn't hire, you know, say a Caucasian director to direct the film? Now that, you know, that was a Broadway play, of course now, and then it went into film. And he said, it's not about race or color, it's about culture, right? And so and he made the reference, he said, you would not get, you know, you wouldn't get Steven Spielberg to direct, um, you know, um, Goodfellas, right? On you, and you wouldn't get Scorsese to go direct, um, you know, a, a Spielberg film like Schindler's List, right? Because culturally, they come from two different upbringings, right? It's nothing about the individual. All of them are great directors, right? And so we think about that from our perspective. And uh, some people, they, they do a pretty good job of researching, you know, our culture and, uh, um, and to some degree and, and having some reference, you know, point. Um, which is great. And, and, and a lot of casting, you know, associates and producers and stuff may not want to take the time to do that sometimes because it is an extra step, right? When, if they're, you know, does, they don't come from that background, right? But it, if they allow and bring on, say, a co-producer or a co-writer that does come from that background, it will deepen, deepen the story, it will deepen the message, um, because one of the things that um, most, I would say, I can't speak for everyone. I can't speak for every tribe across the country. I can really only speak from my personal reference. But um, there were over 30,000 tribal communities across this, you know, this continent, at, or maybe even more, but roughly, right? And, of course, that's been dwindled down to less than 1,000 recognizable tribal communities now. And so, but even in that, there was subtle, there was some large scale differences and some subtle differences, right? So for someone that just said, oh, I went to a powwow and I talked to this one person and I'm gonna write this story about this native group, it, you, you, you start to tread on tricky water, right? Or, you know, you know, because again, that particular group had its own customs and own way of doing things. If you want to cre create something out of the air that's kind of ambiguous, that's an artistic right too, right? And that's okay because then you're not really identifying one place or the other. But I also beg to, I'm not really beg to argue, but I always want to raise the question, like how deep, when you do that, you lose the depth of what it is that is actually out there that exists, right? And so, you know, like when I come to set, you know, I bring, if I'm on the set and I'm doing something and say, for instance, the guy asked me to you know, hunt, like I'm hunting for deer, right? And I think about how my, when I'm in my character or what have you, I'm thinking about all the people and ancestors that I know that did this for their livelihood, right? So that's naturally going to give me the depth of my action that somebody that maybe just did it in the Boy Scouts, right? And he's, you know, I mean, it's just the way it is, right? And so that's why it's important. Again, it may take an extra step, but I think as, um, you know, when I say, I don't necessarily say Hollywood, but just that, you know, um, film and television and theater on stage, I think when they start to look at how much more powerful that story or that message would be by allowing that room for freedom to bring that in, I think they will find that it will connect with people better, right? And it will, of course, tell a story, tell a good story and pay homage to whatever story you're trying to tell. But I think the, the also the takeaway is that the audience member or the person that's viewing that um, or in seeing that will have that much more of a richer experience, right? And that's what, as artists, as storytellers, we hope to achieve, right? And we, I like to sort of credit us as being some of the first storytellers, right? And because when we would go out, we would come back and we would pantomime or we would tell of our journey to our tribal community. But then we were also some of the first actors because some of their, their early films were about the native people here on this continent, right? And those, you know, some of those old, you know, crazy little things that people would film, black and white little pixels moving and stuff. 
that was us on the other side, right? Sharing whatever it is we shared. Maybe we got, you know, I don't want to get into the politics of it all, but uh, I like to think of us being some of the first original storytellers as well as story, um, you know, actors and performers, right? And so, um, you know, that also brings about a big, a lot, a lot of depth to what you have. Um, and I think too that, you know, the voice is very important, meaning that, um, you give him way to the voice in an equitable way, right? I think in today's age, things are moving so fast. People are moving around so much. Um, you know, education, you know, the Native communities have embraced education and gone out, you know, probably 60, over 60 percent of most indigenous people don't live in their tribal community anymore, right? We're living in urban areas or suburban areas or large cities. and um, you know, but we still, have, a lot of us still maintain that connection to our original homelands, right? Or our, those original stories, especially if we walk in a traditional way. And so I think we pretty much see ourselves as equal, right? But the other tab of that is what's the equality like, right? I mean, the, the, um, the equity like, right? So, um, you know, that is, is my voice given just as much weight as someone else's voice at the table, right? So those are the things that we try to look at and, and address with Amarenda, right? Because I don't think it's an issue of equality now. I think it's an issue of equity, right? And then you think about the training that we put in to do what we do or culturally have done, you know, is it given the same amount of weight and voice as someone that maybe went to Juilliard, right? you know, the institution, and I'm not, you know, throwing rocks at the institution, it's great to have institutional training, right? But then at the same time, if I've spent, say, you know, uh, 20 years drumming and singing traditional songs, I may not know technique from an institutional side, but I have practiced just as long as someone on that side, right? And so I feel like in whatever context we are at the table talking about how we can bring our art into this project, um, I think that really, um, you know, should be given equal weight, right? And um, and the equity of that. So that, of course, resources and all of that stuff too. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, and you're right. There's there's no substitute for lived experience, and how that translates from the artist to the audience. There's there's no substitute in getting that. So I think that members of our audience right now certainly understand that in a in a way that um, especially when we're talking about representation, that the lived experience um, is one that resonates the most with the audience uh, in a way that that they can really identify with. And, you know, as we're talking about Amarinda, and as you said, this organization is 35 years old. You've been doing the work um, of really addressing equity um, all the way through as as um, as you've incorporated more programs and and um, and taken on more services within the community. Let's talk about those services and not just what the services are, but what are the hopes behind them um, in providing them to the community themselves? Um, well, the, I would say, the, again, the main hope is to, you know, to continue to, to offer that platform, that larger platform that, um, you know, allows them to tell their story, right, to give value to their work um, in, a, in a larger way, um, you know, uh, you know, they're, a lot of things are, are in some cases can be, I would say, like little pockets of this and pockets of that. And, you know, and, and, and it's good. But if we are, you know, if we are trying to facilitate change, you know, socially with our art or if we are trying to, you know, just change the diaspora of our community into some degree, um, you know, where can we have the largest impact? Right. And, and again, um, and do it in a professional way, right? That's another thing that working at Amarenda and being here in the city, and I credit, um, I'm not the director of Amarenda. I, am, I work there. Again, like you said, I'm the theater program director, but my director, Diane Freyer, um, who is uh, Osage in Cherokee, she really wants to elevate the Native artists, at, again, at a very professional, high-quality level. 
right? Not just throw something together, you're a great artist, but then you're not putting out publications. You're not doing, you know, the, the media blast. You're not doing the full representation in a good way, you know, and th this is how she wants it to be seen. So we're, we're seen as credible, right? And we're seen with the quality and weight of that quality in a good way. Um, and, and I think the legacy of that Right. Because, I mean, they're with the, with the largest uh, movement, you know, the contemporary Native American art movement is the largest movement in the United States outside of Santa Fe, which technically Santa Fe, New Mexico has a the college there. You know, it, it's nationally known as where Native artists go to cultivate their art, but they also come to New York because New York is like the Mecca of everything. Right. And so. Um, if you show well in New York, you pretty much can imagine you're going to do well everywhere else, right? You hope anyway. And so Amarinda is really focused on that, given the, the opportunity, you know, because um, we've had several young people come through our program, well, before I got there, that have been, um, you know, on Forbes 40 for 40 list, right? That, that you know, have made that. Um, Maddie, Madeline Say it is the one I'm mentioning there. And she is Mohegan from up, you know, up in the, uh, Connecticut. And so up there from that tribal community. And so, you know, again, being able to put people in levels where they can make not just a co contribution for us, because again, we see community, right? We see this contribution being for everyone, right? Because at the end of the day, it's it's how that artwork moved you, not you know a certain group of people. It's how it moved everyone, or did not move anyone, or that you know that story that resonated. Did it resonate at a humanistic, human being level, right? Because that's what we all are. And so I think that, you know, um, you know, Amarinda looks at that, not just fitting a niche for Native community, but how can we bring this to the larger world and larger community around us so that everyone can be impacted to some degree, right? And, and understand and then see us as maybe messengers of something that maybe they didn't think about in a certain way, right? Because we do bring that cultural connection back to where our, you know, communities come from that some people may overlook in some, some things, you know, and so that's, I think, Amarinda's uh, really the their, their, their purpose of what they want to try to do, you know, with working with, you know, the Native people we work with, um, and um, it's just, a, it's a good experience, you know, I, I wish we have would have been able to like be a little bit more. We're starting, you know, a small organization. It's just three of us in the office, and I'm just part time, so it's really two of us. Um, and so, you know, but to to have a larger outreach, right? To really start to, you know, um, the, use the use the platforms that can help support that the social media platforms that really can help support that in in a very you know positive way. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think it, the world still can learn a lot about Amarinda. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings us to another one of our questions. How yeah. can our audience right now support Amarinda? How can they learn more about what you do and how they can support you? Well, for one, we, um, you know, we're, we generally either once a year or every other year curate a, you know, an, an exhibit, an art exhibit. Um, and they're working on right now, working on a, uh, a focus on something on uh, they, the previous one they did was about, um, they work with um, uh, the New York, the New York uh, Museum. They did one there. Uh, they were part of the curation of that. Um, but then they, prior to that, they did one for American Indian women. And I think this time they're going to look at focusing a little bit more on uh, American Indian men. Now, uh, with me, we have a, we generally do one to two productions a year in theater, um, which is um, depending on funding, right? We That's one of the things that I do like to talk about too, sometimes it's like the lack of funding that we receive, 
Um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have some of the main pillars of larger organizations that would, you know, help be able to sustain a, a broader program, right? Because then we're always applying every year for whatever, in some cases, whatever we might apply for the max. And they say, okay, well, we'll give you, you know, 80% of what you apply for, right? You know, so it's always kind of that situation. And, um, you know, we don't have, uh, you know, we don't have multi-year funding, like say for 10, 10 years, here's a $200,000, right? Um, we don't have uh, wealthy donors or philanthropy, you know, a lot of philanthropy money that comes in. Um, and we don't have a building. We don't have a physical space. We rent an office right now at a church, and um, but we don't have a place that we can have seasonal programming, right? You know, we can develop a schedule for seasons and, you know, quarterly with people where we could market that, right? We know exactly what we're doing. Um, and um, there's another thing, and I always forget off the four main things sometimes. I always get three. <laughs> But um, I know that, um, but we also, you know, so for my thing, we're doing a, a spring production coming up. So people could go to our website, which you could put in, you know, you Google, you know, just www.amorinda, which is A-M-E-R-I-N-D-A, right? Which is American Indian, just cut and put together, dot .org. Or you can do American Indian Artists org right an inc.org it will come up either of those three ways um and we're doing a full stage production off off broadway um it's um it's not a uh equity contract but it's a production pretty large pr good production um in the spring in the late spring and what we hope to do with that is actually you know we we want to we get some resources from you guys so we can um, you know, we'll reach back out to some formal resources we had for someone from the ASL organizations to come and, and sign a couple of our shows. But we also want to try one thing we haven't done before, and that is offer maybe at least two shows to be video uh, cast, whether it be on YouTube platform or whatever. I'm not technically savvy with all of that, but um to, to offer that to visually impaired, right? So they can actually hear the, the show, right? Or somehow, um, and, um, you know, but we've also employed at Amarinda, you know, we, we one of our playwrights, you know, he was an amputee and we, we con constantly, we probably, you know, used him more than we probably should. <laughs> <laughs> and getting his work out there. But um, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. But yet, you know, we've, we've worked with various people in our community and supported them in various ways. Um, but with your organization, that's what we would really like to do because, you know, again, um, I think, um, you know, also tapping into that resource of actors, right? Like I'm, I'm starting to do some playwright stuff and learn that process. And, you know, we have individuals that may be in those plays that, you know, we might need those resources for that we technically don't really, we sort of stumble upon them in a sense, because again, we're a small organization, we're in the city. So people might come here and miss us, right? We don't have a technically, the closest tribal community is either in New Jersey, South Jersey, or way out in Long Island. And so we don't really, you know, unless they come to the city to do something, <laughs> Specific, specifically, we don't really have a, a lot that, you know, where they come down to be in a play, right? Because it's such so far to travel and we can't offer housing either. You know, that's another challenge can be, that we have. And um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think we, it's a lot of things that we can work together to do, um, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to do so because one of my good friends, his wife used to work with us some because she also signed for the um the courthouse you know down in the city she was a contractor that worked there independently and she you know she offered help to us as well um and um i think it's just it's just great because i used i used to do asl when i was in college and so i thought that you know it would be just great to continue that um, I'm not very great at it no more because I have, I used to know a little bit my name and, you know, a little bit of this and that, <laughs> but um, I, I can get there very quickly if I have to, 
but <laughs> um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm glad you guys reached out to us and, and um, you know, I think it's incredible work. Um, again, expanding um, the outreach, uh, again, having em everyone's voice impor is, is important, um, you know, because again, we, you know, sometimes again, we see ourselves in these little bubbles, right, sometimes. And I think, you know, we might need somebody to kind of tap us on the head and to say, hey, it's, it's a larger world out there that we need to be considering all the time, right? And so but we thank you for reaching out too and joining in with us. Yes, we are so excited to hear about the production that's going to be late in the spring. And hopefully you'll come back on and talk to us about that. And we can promote that a little bit here. Yeah. It's been so great talking to you uh, both the time before and now. And um, and as you start to get more uh, information about your upcoming projects, certainly send them to us and we will list them in the description of this podcast, as well as uh, being able to cross promote them with uh, with us on social media. Um, is there anything else that you want to let our audience know about before we sign off today, John? Uh, yes. Um, you know, I employ everyone to, you know, um, you know, to just to, to continue to listen, to continue to be open. Um, you know, again, to embrace humanity, that everyone's voice, you know, whether it may be, it may come from a different, you know, a, come from a different background or a different perspective or a different area than your own. But there, if you take the time to listen, you'll find some commonalities. Yes, right. We, we all know that because we're all human. Um, but you also may find something that will, you know, will, will um, spark or enlightened in some way and you can be like, wow, okay, I never thought of it that way. Or, or wow, you know, would it be okay if I, I, I utilize that idea? I right? just want to <laughs> still ideas. But, you know, these are things and it's like, um, and, you know, and again, it's about that inclusiveness, right? You know, um, and I think that's one thing that, of course, you know, the pandemic put a lot of focus across the world on a lot of things. Um, but I think as we move forward, there's still... You know, because again, once people generally get comfortable, they kind of fall back into their normal mode of things. And I think if we, if but if we keep that, um, I guess that uh, that vision of what that situation taught us and that openness, that we can create a much broader, you know, uh, storyline and of inclusiveness. And um, you know, I'm hoping that as we continue to push forward with Amarinda, that we grow our programming that we are able to reach uh, more, more audience members um, than, than ever before. And that, you know, our impact, you know, again, will be felt across the board, right? And, um, and that, you know, because my the director actually is sitting on the, um, she's a part of the arts and council group with the new mayor, right? And so, um, you know, which is, um, or the governor, mayor, governor, I get confused. <laughs> but but, but she's, she's, she's doing things that she had never done before, so to speak, and very, you know, in areas that, you know, is, is again, bringing our voice to the table. Um, and, you know, and again, because, you know, we do, again, have that, still have that closer connection to things from our community, especially those that still walk that way from our community in traditional way. You know, our mindset sometimes is initially maybe like, well, what are they really talking about? What if, but if you think about where it's really coming from, like how we see again, you know, working as community, right? So one of the things, an example, I just want to give you, probably y'all can cut this if you want, because I know that wasn't part of all these questions. But one of the things that we like to say is like, okay, sometimes, you know, organizations want to work with Native people and they are hire someone that, you know, maybe say they're American Indian or what have you, but they may be very scholarly. They may have went to school. They may have done certain things, right? But they come to the table and a lot of times their approach is just like the system that has taught them to be the way they are. But the way we see things from our perspective in the community is that we, as a collective body, we decide who speaks for the group, right? And then also, you know, a lot of organizations want to work with us, but have they ever come to meet us? 
right? Have they ever come, like you guys are meeting us, right? You're saying, hi, I'm here, wanna get to know you guys, right? And we know each other now, we've seen each other twice. <laughs> and hope, like you said, hopefully you come to the play and you know, but we get, we've get funding from organizations that have never come to an Amarinda play, never come to a curated art show, right? But then they wonder why we may struggle with, you know, um, certain aspects of funding or, you know, when we submit an application or what have you. But have they ever asked us, what are some of the barriers that you guys face? Let us try to create a, a, a process that will help you guys to step up higher. Instead, we're always constantly trying to still squeeze a square peg in a round hole, right? And that's the thing that I really would like to see changed, right? You know, um, and because it just like in another situation, I served on a board with um, TCG during the pandemic and we would talk to various theaters across the country and stuff like that and they would be on. And one of the things I found out there was that um, a lot of times some people want to offer you money, but yet your program may not even be at the level that it needs to be to utilize that funding properly, right? And so they really need to look at how can we help them build capacity better so then they could step up and do, you know, but these are, these are, but these are things that, that make everybody better. Of course, it takes time to do that, right? And it takes a little effort, but I think if a little bit more effort on the front end will yield a better result on the back end, right? And so... You know, I'd like to thank you guys for reach, reaching out to us. I've enjoyed talking to you twice now. <laughs> um, we're in production right now. Like we're ramping up the actors and we're getting everybody, you know, to the table to set people and all of that stuff. So I think you'd be, you know, if you make it to one of our plays, I think you'd be pretty pleased and you say they did a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate, yeah, talking to you again. It's always good to talk to you. And I am hoping to get down there to see the show. So I look forward to meeting you in person. And certainly as things are uh, moving forward, send them to us and we'll be happy to post them. John, it was so good talking to you today. You too. You too. Thank you so much. Be wild paleo in my Tudor language. Thank you. <laughs>The closed captioned and ASL version of this podcast is available on our YouTube channel. To listen to more Empire State of Rights closed captioned, follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify.